when Coach Paterno was fired, the only information they had was from the Attorney General's office uh, via Mike McQuarrie, who alleged in the presentment made against Jerry Sandusky that, that somehow Mike McQuarrie passed on information to Coach Paterno. But we never did know exactly what he passed on. And as we know afterwards, Mike McQuarrie changed his story several times. And I think at worst, the worst scenario for Coach Paterno was that Mike McQuarrie said he saw something of a sexual nature, and Coach Paterno passed that on. According to uh, Coach Paterno, he passed that on to Tim Curley and Gary Schultz, who took over from there. So I think when you look at this, the fact that Coach Paterno was fired without there ever being any piece of evidence to support any allegation of wrongdoing, I think was patently, patently an abuse of authority on a part of the Board of Trustees. And of course, you may know that I said that from the beginning, that I was uh, one of the staunch defenders of Coach Paterno and, and Tim Curley and Gary Schultz and, 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 and saying to the media, which fell upon deaf ears, unfortunately, I think more often than not, that, you know, why don't we let the facts play out? Why don't we let the legal system play out? You know, as an attorney, you look for the facts and you follow the facts and the facts lead you to conclusions. You don't start off with conclusions and say, we think there was a cover-up and we think that Coach Paterno and the other university officials did something wrong and then set out to prove that by squeezing whatever you can find in to fit, to fit that, that theory. And I think that's what happened here. The conspiracy theory involving Penn State officials makes absolutely no sense because if you buy into it, then you have to believe that not only were they covering up what Jerry Sandusky was doing that they knew he was doing, but they were letting their athletes actively participate in promoting the very program that, according to the Commonwealth's theory, he was using to, to groom kids for, for future sexual acts. It just is totally absurd to buy into that, that argument. How in the world could intelligent people think that they were covering up something to avoid embarrassment for Penn State by continuing to allow this person to come on campus, by letting your athletes engage in, in activities with the very program that the Commonwealth later alleged was being used to groom these kids? And in fact, ironically, we proved that Jerry Sandusky's trial, among other things. Mike McQuarrie participated as a guest star in the golf tournament for the second mile, not only later in 2001, following the February alleged incident that he says he saw, although he changed his story a number of times, but he also participated in it in 2004. I mean, how, how does that make sense? If you saw what he says he saw, you saw graphic sex between Jerry Sandusky and a kid. How in the world could you then perpetuate the very program that Jerry had founded and was running, knowing that he's grooming kids if you buy into that story, and, and participate as a, as a player in a golf tournament where you're listed as a star? It, it makes no sense. Absolutely not. He came in with his brother and his mother, sat down with me initially, and said, I believe I'm the person that the Attorney General is talking about in regard to the charges relating to number two. And I said, how do you know that? And he said, because I remember a night when I was in the shower with Jerry after we worked out, and he said it was routine after working out, we'd get a shower. He said, we heard a door open, and we didn't see anybody, but the door to the shower room, the facility was open. And although they didn't see anybody, they knew somebody had come in but didn't think anything of it. And he said within a few days, Jerry approached me and said that he had been contacted by a Penn State official, he didn't say who it was, and that the Penn State official might want to talk with him about what was going on that night. And he said, if that's the case, he said nothing was going on, Jerry was not doing anything sexual to me. When I read that allegation, he said I was shocked. He said, Jerry's been like a father to me, Jerry never did not, done anything sexually with me. And he said, if anything, Jerry basically was important in saving my life and helping me to grow up to be a good, productive person. And did you believe this person? Yes, he was very credible. And you have to understand, he was there with his brother and his mother. Jerry Sandusky was nowhere in the building. Jerry Sandusky did not call me and tell me this young man was coming in. I walked into my office. My secretary said somebody made an appointment. I didn't even know who he was at the time. And there he was with his mom and his brother. I believe he and his brother were both in their 20s. 
And he went on to tell me for an extended period of time how Jerry had been like a father to him, had stood in for his father at his last football game, had, att had attended his wedding, uh, had spoken at his, his high school graduation as a commencement speaker at his request, how he had driven 10 hours to see uh, Jerry and Jerry's family when Jerry's mother passed away and he was in the military. I had no reason whatsoever to disbelieve him. And what the young kid said now in his 20s is that he was at one end of the shower and the shower where they were located had multiple shower heads. He turned all the shower heads on and he would run from one end to the other with water collecting on the shower floor and Maybe that's what Mike McQuarrie heard when he said he heard the slapping sound. It sounded like sexual activity. But the young guy said he'd, go, he'd run from one end of the shower to the other and slide, kind of like surfing without a surfboard. But he was absolutely adamant that he was the young boy involved in that. I was working with a private investigator, a retired police chief, very, very credible, outstanding person, FBI trained. He had graduated from the FBI Academy and had been a police officer many, many years before retiring. And this person, in the presence of his mother and his brother, told him not only the same, the same facts, but the police officer, now private investigator, said to me later, this is going to be a great witness for Jerry Sandusky. This is going to blow this case out of the water. Because at the time, that was their big case, and that's why we went after it, because it involved Mike McQuarrie. It involved somebody supposedly independent who was telling a horrendous story, if you believe the Commonwealth's allegations contained in the complaint uh, against Jerry Sandusky. So we were thrilled to say the least that here was this individual who might turn out to be number two who could blow this whole story out of the water. Could you evaluate for us this incredible revelation that the prosecution is essentially trying to claim now that victim two doesn't exist because they don't like his story? Well, I think, I think the, the Commonwealth found itself in a, a very difficult situation. The Commonwealth was aware that, that, that the person who said that he was number two had spoken to us and had given an exculpatory version of what happened, meaning that he said Jerry Sandusky didn't do anything sexual with him, not only that night, but ever. So that if they had information from the same person at a later date saying that now all of a sudden he was a victim and Jerry had abused him time and time again, obviously if they had called him, we could have cross-examined him. I could have brought in the retired police chief to say, wait a minute, this person didn't say this to us. This person told us that Jerry never did a thing to him inappropriately. The voicemail message that Jerry leaves for the person claiming to be victim to during the grand jury investigation. I interpret that as clearly he's been asked to come forward by the prosecution. He wasn't called. What can we interpret from that in a logical world? Well, if that's the case, obviously what you can interpret is that his testimony might have hurt the Commonwealth's case. But I can say this, because this was made public, the two voice messages that were played Jerry identified as being the person who was in my office. And so I can say, because they were made public by the person's attorneys, that the voice messages came from the person who sat in my office saying that Jerry never abused him ever, not only not that night, in 2002, 2001, whatever it was, although we know it was 2001, and Jerry told me that information right away because he remembered the incident. But, but we know that that's the person who was in my office. And Jerry remembered calling him and talking with him and saying, if you're contacted, just tell him the truth. There's no big deal about this. It's not a story. It's not a problem. So you don't believe that victim two was abused in the shower that night? And uh, I, I do not. I never did. And in fact, he sat in my office very candidly, very calmly. And, and, and I deal with people all the time and get a, get a pretty good feel pretty quickly. But this was over the course of 30 minutes, 45 minutes, followed by an experienced investigator who talked with him for another hour or two. And we both came to the same conclusion, that he was telling us the truth and that this was going to be a very critical part of Jerry's defense until, of course, he left the office and within a week or so retained private counsel and became a victim. You basically give the essence of this information that, hey, look, the shower victim has come forward and tells a very different story. And Bob Costas doesn't even follow up. He doesn't even seem to think that this is all that important information. Have you been struck by that and the fact that the media is so 
lacking in curiosity about this revelation? I was, I was, to say I was surprised, if not shocked, by a number of things the media has done throughout this case would be an understatement. It became clear to me following that interview that, that, that the media, including the national media, was of a mindset that not only was Jerry guilty, but that Penn State officials had been involved in a cover-up. And that's all they wanted to talk about, that's all they wanted to explore. And it's a shame because I've talked with, with older journalists and they, they tell me the same thing I know as an attorney. You get the facts. You don't start off with a premise. Uh, if you want to be on Inside, inside Edition, start off with the premise and, and sensationalize and to get viewers to watch. But if you're really an investigative journalist, you get the facts. It just makes no sense that they had any inkling that he was doing this. As a matter of fact, what might well have happened is that because of the 98 situation, which was unfounded, totally unfounded, and, and, and then 91 came along where maybe McQuarrie says, I saw Jerry in a shower, it made me feel uncomfortable. And, and just perhaps Tim Curley saying, well, this is another 98 situation. I'm not being told there was sex. I'm not being told there was some graphic in a, inappropriate behavior and said at that point, okay, it's another 98 situation, but nothing came of it. There was no sexual activity. We know that. In fact, accuser number six testified at Jerry's trial in June that there was no sexual activity in 98. So we know that that's a fact. And so it's quite conceivable that if McQuarrie went to Curley and said, I saw something, Jerry in a shower, that made me feel uncomfortable, Curley and Schultz said, another 98, you know, let's not go through the whole dog and pony process we went through three years ago. Let's get Jerry in and say, Jerry, you don't bring kids in the shower. That's it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Does it make sense? Does it make sense if they were told Jerry was having anal sex, which was the allegation and a presentment made against Jerry last November 5th, that Jerry was engaged in anal sex with a 10-year-old looking boy, that the response would be just don't bring kids in the shower? That makes absolutely no sense. It's patently absurd for anyone to accept that premise. When Joe Paterno was fired and allegations were made about what he knew, what Coach Paterno knew, Jerry was absolutely devastated by it. And again, for all those reasons and, and, and a number of times that I spoke with Jerry about this very issue, was there a cover-up, could there have been, was there any conversation between you, Tim Curley, Gary Schultz, uh, Graham Spanier, about what you supposedly were doing and, 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 and their efforts to maybe kind of conceal it? He said, Joe, absolutely not, never. He said, never, ever. In fact, had he had that kind of information, I mean, as an attorney, I can tell you it might have been his advantage to use it to make, make a better deal for himself. But he was adamant about his innocence. He never would talk a plea. He never wanted to even talk about a negotiated disposition in this case. He was adamant about the fact that Joe Paterno never spoke with him, never mentioned that he even knew about the 2001 and 1998 situations. And he was adamant that there was never, ever any cover-up on the part of anybody to his knowledge. Let's talk about Mike McQuarrie. First of all, he gets the date, the month, and the year of the episode flat wrong. Right off the bat, how do you evaluate that fact? Well, it, it creates a serious credibility issue for him, of course. But you have to understand, at least from my perspective and my opinion, his accusations were a linchpin, were the foundation to establish credibility for all the other allegations. And so the Commonwealth had to stick with him. And, 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 and obviously, I'm sure without being told this or knowing specifically because they mentioned it to me and obviously they would have no reason to, they had to be rather embarrassed when we pointed out to them and later it was established that this thing happened early in 2001. And we know it because number two had spoken with us and he was saying that nothing happened, that whatever you were saying that Mike McQuarrie told you guys wasn't true because nothing sexually occurred. Are you startled that so few people even know that McQuarrie got the date wrong? The reason for that, in my opinion, is simple. Nobody wanted to know it. Just like the media didn't want to know it. Everybody wanted to believe Jerry Sandusky was guilty and Penn State officials engaged in a massive cover-up to protect Penn State's image. Again, patently absurd, in my opinion, when you look at it objectively uh, from outside. But nobody wanted to hear the possibility that this wasn't true. 
And, and so the media reported the one side of it, and, and the public read the one side of it, and, and nobody looked behind, the, looked behind the, the, glaring, the glaring allegations to say, well, it doesn't add up. What do you believe Mike McQuarrie saw in the shower that night? Here's what I think happened. And, and, it, and it, it plays right in. It fits perfectly in with what Tim Curley says occurred. I think he went into the shower, as he said, wasn't sure when it was, wasn't any reason to remember a specific date because it wasn't monumental. He saw Sandusky in there in the shower with the young guy. It made him feel uncomfortable. Mike was a macho guy, a football player, 6'4", he's a big guy. He was always very proud of the fact he was a Penn State quarterback. It bothered him. So he made a comment to Joe Paterno. Yeah, look, I, I saw Sandusky in a shower with a kid. It really made me feel uneasy. And that's what he told Tim Curley and Gary Schultz. And their actions, I think, speak that that's what they were told because what they say is Jerry just don't go in a shower anymore with kids it's making people feel uncomfortable you know some people don't don't think that that's appropriate although there was testimony by Dick Anderson and, and Booker Brooks two two former coaches saying it was very common for grown-ups to get showers with the kids after they worked out not at all unusual but I think that's what he saw now over time over a period of 10 years, I think what happened when he was approached by the Attorney General's office, uh, and, and people who aren't familiar with the investigative processes of a grand jury, it's very one-sided. It's not where one side gets to ask questions like a courtroom setting and the other side gets to ask questions and maybe you get to the truth because you have two different, two different sides who are involved in it. Grand jury is being conducted by the prosecutor. The prosecutor asks leading questions and they can lead people right down the path to what they're trying to get the people to say. And I think it's very possible that after all that time elapsed, that I think that they got Mike to the point where Mike said, well, it seems sexual to me, and they just took it one step further. And as I said, even to the point where, according to Mike, and this is from Mike McQuarrie's mouth, that what they said in that presentment about seeing anal sex, he said he never said that. So even he admitted he never said that, and yet that was the inflammatory material that went out to the public and the media last November 5th that ignited a, a, a holocaust of storm of, of, of activity against Penn State, and Joe Paterno, and everybody else. And of course, Jerry ended up being not guilty on that charge. That's right, ironically. Everybody made an issue out of the fact that when Coach Paterno allegedly said uh, that Mike, when he came to him that Saturday morning, talked about something of a sexual nature. Well, if he said that, then Mike must have told him that. But what's very possible is that an 85-year-old man, when he was confronted with these allegations, might have called his assistant or former assistant coach, Mike McQuarrie, and said, hey, Mike, what was that conversation we had back in whenever it was, 2002, I'm sure Joe Paterno couldn't, couldn't recollect what year it was, just like Mike McQuarrie couldn't recollect what year it was. And it's very possible that Mike at that point might have said, well, yeah, Coach, I told you I saw Jerry Sandusky engaging in some sort of activity that looks sexual in nature. Could very well account. I mean, we're talking about an 85-year-old man. I mean, he's like our grandfather, for crying out loud. And, 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 and pinning him to the wall in terms of what he was told 11 years ago, when he was still an older gentleman at 74, 75, I think was patently unfair. And as I said, there are explanations as to how he might have even come to think that that was what was said back in 2001, whenever it was. And, and I think it's important for people to understand that it's quite possible that that conversation between McCoury and he occurred. That I really don't believe he ever was. Just like I don't believe that Tim Curley and Gary Schutz were told that they, that Mike McQuarrie, observed graphic sex in the shower between Sandusky and, and, and this young boy. Uh, but even assuming he was told something of a sexual nature occurred, he did what he was supposed to do. So where's the culpability? And how does that equate? How does that equate to firing him on the phone, by phone, after years and years, not only of service, but contributions to Penn State and the community, not just the athletic department? And, and I think it was a knee-jerk reaction on the part of the trustees. It was a knee-jerk reaction on the part of the media and the public to just automatically conclude that Joe Paterno and the other university officials were guilty of some massive cover-up. When in fact, if you look at it objectively, it just doesn't make any sense. It never did make any sense. Give us your assessment of how Mike McQuarrie is likely to fare as 
as a witness and his credibility is likely to fare in the next set of trials? Well, I, I think I think Mike's going to have some serious problems. I, I really think the inconsistent statements he's made, as well as potentially any reasons why he may have made statements that he made, I think will all come out in a civil suit, which of course he's filed. And of course, potentially in the criminal action against Tim Curley and Gary Schultz and now Graham Spanier, because I suspect he's going to be called as a witness at their trials. And uh, he'll be subjected to very, very tough cross-examination. And at trial, you can get into motive that you can get into motivations or motives as to why people may make allegations which aren't necessarily accurate. Uh, you may be able to get into some background information of uh, that you might otherwise not be able to get into. But he's in for a tough go of it. Bottom line, it for me, I find it amazing that from a Penn State and Joe Paterno perspective, all of this basically hinges on the word of one guy who doesn't seem to be very credible. Give us your evaluation of the, the notion that all of this is hinging on a witness that really has a lot of problems. Well, and, and, and that's at the heart of the allegations, which so many people have, have just totally accepted as being true, to basically undo 60 plus years of, of wonderful activities and accomplishments on the part of someone like Joe Paterno, for example. And, Grand Spanier's accomplishments and Tim Curley's and Gary Schultz's accomplishments. Based upon, when you look at it, the inconsistent statements of one person, and that's all this comes down to. Now, of course, they say they have some emails, but that remains to be seen what they, what they actually say and what they mean. But this all came down to one person's accusations about what he said he saw, first on March 1st, 2002, and then later when we pointed it out to the Commonwealth, Oops, we made a mistake. Now we, we realize it was February of 2001. I, I think is a total disservice to the people who gave so much of their lives, so much of their time uh, to making Penn State, making the athletic department, making the community, making the entire region and state of Pennsylvania just a much better place in which to live and provided so many good works and so many good things to so many thousands of young people over the years. How amazing is it the, the media narrative is something that Mike McQuarrie, by his own admission, never even told somebody at the time? Well, and think about how damning that is in terms of his credibility. Take Dr. Dranoff, for example. He's a mandated reporter for sexual abuse involving kids. And what he tells us is that Mike McQuarrie never said those things, never talked about sex or sex acts. He says, that Mike McQuarrie made it clear when he asked him three separate times the night he came back to his parents' home, did you see Jerry engaging in sex? And he said, Mike McQuarrie said no. How telling is that? And yet again, as I pointed out several times so far, because the public and the media wanted to believe all these terrible things happened and that all these people were involved, they chose to ignore that. When in fact, had this been just a regular person charged with, with the same sort of activities, there's a good chance he would have been acquitted because of the inconsistencies, because we proved that police coach, they even lied at trial for crying out loud about testimony earlier that day and, 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 and whether or not they had talked about it. So you believe that if the Mike McQuarrie allegations had to stand on their own, Jerry would have been found not guilty on all of them? Absolutely. Absolutely. 